So we go to the agenda. Welcome everyone. Uh, first, I will introduce myself. I'm Christine Batusa. I work with Environmental Management for Livelihood Improvement. We are based in Kampala, Uganda. And for CBA 14, I'm coordinating the adaptation technology theme together with Chris Anderson. And for this session, it is a joint session with the youth uh, theme under the CBA 14. So just to take you through the agenda, for this session, we are going to have an introduction and two short Ignite presentations that will go for 30 minutes. Then we shall have breakout groups to discuss the challenge um, for 30 minutes as well. Then uh, thirdly, we shall do a plenary to report back and that will take two minutes for each group. So each facilitator or rapporteur in the breakout group will be able to report back in the main session. And the discussions for the round, uh, for the breakout uh, group they will be for 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, basically this whole session is under the adaptation technology theme that focuses on how can technology be used to bring about adaptation at scale that is across sectors and regional at, and also at the regional level. Uh, the main question is how can adaptation technology help rebuild sustainable systems in a post COVID-19 world? So the, the proposal for this session now is that uh, uh, is looking at how can adaptation technologies enable young people to thrive in rural areas. And this is particularly relevant now as many overseas or urban migrants have returned to their rural homes because of COVID-19. And the main challenge is that the youth view agriculture as a failure, and yet they are returning to the rural areas where agriculture is majorly being done. And they consider agriculture as a last resort. So our hypothesis for this session is that if we can better involve young people so they benefit and their energy and innovation commitment is also harnessed, then adaptation can truly happen at scale. Uh, noting that adaptation is one of the means of implementation for adaptation and the young people are so much interested in adaptation. So for this particular session, we are focusing on uh, how adaptation technologies are enabling young people to develop agribusiness and rural livelihoods adaptation technologies that work for young women, and also how COVID-19 create new opportunities related uh, for young people to engage in adaptation. So basically that is what we are looking for. Broadly, we are discussing how can adaptation technologies enable young people to so highlighting those particular technologies that work for them and how we can also interest them and the opportunities there is for, that have been created by the COVID-19. So that is it, and that will be elaborated in the, in the two IGNITE presentations, one by now on. Um, so at this moment, I'm going to invite, oh, sorry. The first IGNITE presentation is going to be done by Naman Wadego. Nyaminda, who is a senior project officer in charge of agroecology with practical action in Kenya. So uh, Naman is going to be making a presentation on transforming rural economies and youth livelihoods. But before that, uh, we are going to have a poll that is going to be run by Naomi. So Naomi, you are invited to Oh, okay. That's already, I see it's already running. So as uh, the poll is being, as you're responding to the poll questions, I will invite the first Ignite presentation by Naman. Naman, you're welcome. Thank you, Christine, for giving me this opportunity. My name is Naman Nyabinda, working with the <clears throat> Practical Action in Kenya. And uh, we are working on the project of called Transforming Rural Economies and Youth Livelihoods, working in Lake Victoria region, covering Kisumu and Homa Bay County. The project is working with the youths between the age of 25 to 35, and that calls for possible discretion 
how can tears irrigate debt plantation in the desert? Trail project promotes three value chains, that is poultry, groundnuts, and tomatoes. And in Kenya, we find that approximately 800,000 young people enter labor market every year. The Lake Victoria Basin, like any other region in Kenya, experience high rate of youth unemployment, which is estimated at 35%. And 80% of unemployed, unemployed Kenyans are below the age of 35. Young people have negative perception on agriculture. They see agriculture as dirty, not rewarding, laborious, and meant for the old. Most of the young people after finishing colleges prefer migrating to urban areas to seek for white collar job, which never exists. Transforming rural, tran <coughs> trail project, which is transforming rural economies and youth livelihoods project is employing participatory market system development to scale up agriculture through incorporation of agroecology technologies. The project is facilitating market actors across the entire subsector and that include producers, processors, retailers, service providers to come together and form market interest groups that identify underlying system level ch challenges. Then they co-create potential solutions and implement them with the support from the project. Next slide, please. No, you have gone so much. One back step. How can adaptation technologies enable young people? Young people, <coughs> young people in Kenya produce, young people in Kenya in poultry production accumulate a good number, a good amount of chicken manure. They normally pack them and sell to the farmers doing horticulture production. This improves soil fertility and reduces external input. In vermiculture technology, young people use, they like using animal manure, kitchen waste, and other ways to cultivate black soldier fly larvae and earthworms as a source of cheap, safe, and sustainable protein for their poultry. Through that process also, they produce vermiliquid, which is used as pest repellent, foliar feed, and for producing adaptive hydroponics from finger and from, from finger millet and sorghum seeds, which are rich in vitamins and minerals for poultry. Vermicompost is also used to boost soil fertility for other crop production. In adaptive brooding technology, young people prefer using improvised clay pots packed with dry cow dung to warm their young chicks. This reduces cost of electricity and use and continuous use of charcoal that destroys environment. Next slide, please. Why would a young, young people choose an enterprise like poultry? Poultry gives young people year-round production. It is not affected by any season. They can start small and expand. The improved local breeds are well adapted to different environments. And the enterprise promotes circularity in nutrient cycle and other regenerative agriculture. Their feeds can locally be produced. Private sector engagement in capacity building, backward linkages, adversary services to young people can take this model to the next level. However, more still needs to be done. My question to you as I end this presentation is, how can we make this happen? How can we change the perception of young people on agriculture? Thank you. Thank you so much, Naman, um, and thank you so much for sh showcasing the technologies that young people can use as well as the enterprises and for raising the question on how we can change the young people, the young people's perception about agriculture, which they consider as being a dirty uh, kind of nature. 
So uh, this, this meeting will help to highlight those opportunities and ad adaptation technologies that can be adopted by the young people. So at this moment, now I'm still free to launch the next uh, poll question as I invite Ms. Mah Mahmouda Miti to do the second presentation uh, that is on how young people are adapting and flourishing and flourishing at the four, at the four lines of climate change. Ms. Mahmouda is a research officer at International Center for Climate Change and Development, Independent University of Bangladesh. Um, she has knowledge of climate change adaptation, migration capacity building, and urban development through working at uh, ICAD. So Ms. Mahmouda, you're welcome to do the next. Uh, thank you uh, and hello everyone. Uh, this is Mahmouda. So like the project that I am going to talk about is the participatory research and ownership with technology information and changes. So the study, the study area of this project were coastal area, Charland and Howard area. All these three areas are from extremely climate vulnerable region of Bangladesh where people are suffering a lot to secure their livelihood. Next slide, please. Um, however, now many community people, uh, especially young women, are taking plethora of initiatives for adapting and thriving of the climate, uh, at the climate change front line. So for example, they're planting vegetable on site and or tower they are using, uh, they are also practicing bed gardening. Uh, in the southern part of Bangladesh, people are using saline tolerant seeds to ensure sustainable food security. In addition, most of them are raising dog, goats, and cows as alternative livelihood because they believe that multiple working options for vulnerable community can be a window of success. Next slide, please. Okay. So they got several adaptation related training based on their needs and gaps, which helps them to become financially independent and helps to get decision making power. They are using several agriculture related apps, uh, for example, like uh, agriculture, Krishoker uh, Janala, which means uh, window of agriculture. And they also uh, got connected with local government officials to get relevant information. They, all, they have also access to information on agrometeorology, uh, early warning, weather forecast, and market rates. They are also maintaining a communication chain through social media like Facebook, where they discuss about uh, different challenges and solutions. They have also a strong connections with their neighbors and local government. And all of these interventions help them to come up with these unexpected innovations. Next slide, please. So now I would like to conclude my presentation with a question for further discussion, which is how can we improve the engagement of young people or gender in adaptation? and what technology we should use. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Mahmouda. Uh, you still showcase the adaptation technologies that can be used by young people. And then you also pose a question on which other adaptation uh, technologies that can really attract the young people to still engage in agriculture. And these will be some of the questions that will be discussed in the breakaway sessions. So at this point, I will invite Josh to take us through what, how the breakout group sessions are going to be. Josh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christine. Um, and thanks to all participants who are here. I just posted the questions in the chat. Um, so first of all, I mean, it's to hear these um, essays that has been done uh, um, by Mamadou and also um, to hear the example of uh, agriculture in, in Africa and poultry, sort of how technology can, can, can enhance that. Uh, we are very keen, and I think uh, um, uh, Mamouda ended with really uh, very interesting questions. What technologies are we talking about? 
Uh, and this is something to, to consider. How accessible will these technologies be? Uh, and also the first speaker already talked about how young people do not find agriculture as very enthusiastic. Uh, um, and hence, there is a need to sort of enhance that using technology. Um, so thanks a lot, Naman, for, for those insights. Uh, for the breakout room, it will be assigned uh, uh, randomly. So you find yourself in a room uh, and you have one of these three questions to discuss. And of course, if you are able to adjust answering these questions, please, you can move on to another one. But I'm just quickly going to speak out the, these questions for you to sort of verbally hear it, uh, which is very helpful. So how can adaptation technologies enable young people to engage in rural agriculture and enterprise? Uh, and here emphasis on enterprise because um, as we heard before, agriculture itself, or sort of traditional agriculture does not seem very attractive uh, uh, per se. And the enterprise component of it, as Naman mentioned, uh, makes it more exciting in the case of Kenya. So really thinking around how we can use technologies to enhance the enterprise uh, structures of agriculture to allow young people to find that very important and interesting. The second question is how can adaptation technologies work for young women? And here the focus is on gender. Uh, and we will know that when we talk about adaptation, uh, particularly in global South, that women are sort of disproportionately uh, affected uh, and have to suffer much of the risk and the pain of it. So if we are going to look into adaptation technologies, how does that enhance the participation of women in delivering solutions, but also how does that help to restore dignity uh, and to help the work they do uh, so that they are not in a disadvantage and sort of establish uh, uh, equity and equality in communities. The third question, of course, COVID has um, put uh, all of us, the whole world, uh, uh, in a very new environment uh, as we are having CBA 14 online, which was planned to be in person. So in different angles, this has affected everyone. In creating new technologies, and I mean, we need to admit that from March 2020 till now, the rise in technology uptake has been tremendous. I mean, Zoom, the platform we are using now, has seen a significant rise uh, in users. Uh, um, so these things are sort of transforming the way we operate, the way we work, the way we organize. And it's very important to think that as we go through this technology uh, sort of uh, uptake uh, and the green recovery process which governments are talking about, how do we make sure that these new technologies work for young people, present opportunities for young people to engage in adaptation. So these are the three questions. I believe that uh, uh, Naomi, the support person, have set up the rooms and uh, ready for us to go in. I will give a small uh, uh, glitch for you to be aware that once the rooms are open, you will be disconnected for like three seconds or four seconds. Uh, and when that disconnect happens, just stay calm and you'll find yourself in your room. So it's just going to be a small bit to, to the breakout from which you are assigned to. Um, so we really look forward to your amazing conversations. And when we come back, we allow rapporteurs and facilitators to report back, as well as participants. And we thank you very much. Naomi, please, the breakout room. So we've got three questions, basically. Um, the first one's around enterprise, young people engaging in enterprise. I mean, that's very much a, I think that's closely related to finance and some of you have been talking about finance already. So would anyone like to open it up? We've had the example from Kenya, uh, young people around the Lake Basin in Kenya, which is a sort of high potential area. It's not a, a mud, you know, it's a, but yet we still see young people leaving the agriculture sector, leaving rural areas. So, I mean, how do you get enterprises to work with young people in rural areas? That's a huge challenge. Any thoughts on that, Shail? Hi, um, since Bangladesh is a more or less agriculture-based and fishery-based country, we do have an idea and precedence towards it, but in the recent years, it has decreased. But what we found out is that there are better newer technologies that are coming out for um, fisheries that we can do at home basically. It's called a bioflocking or basically through um, isolation flocking where we take a small tank made of maybe concrete or maybe through um, plastic or PVC and in there we allow water to flow and then cultivate fish from there and it's giving a higher yield of revenue from that. 
and youth are basically the people who have taken an interest towards it. Like basically my friend who currently graduated from um, our university is uh, taking a step towards it and has made a project of his own. It's like a pilot project right beside his house, in a small patch of land that doesn't require much. So I believe that it's coming in if we can give out the information as well as the technological know-how to the youth and it becomes a bit more lucrative since agriculture is seen not really seen as something to be frowned upon. It's something to be celebrated in our country. So yeah. So you would actually push back on what Naman said there about uh, young people having a negative perception about agriculture. You're saying there's a lot of agriculture that young people have a positive perception about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In, in our country, it's total opposite. Um, people have a positive perspective, uh, perception of it, especially on the bioflock and as well as there's this new kind of goat, I forgot the name, um, I think in Bangla it's called Khoryal. So what they do is that um, they try and rear them up in a very small area, like let's say a garage, and then they can be sold off at like high marked up prices. And youth who are basically finishing their undergrads are currently the people who are interested in going into that sector. Interesting thing there. The examples you talk about are very intensive. Intensive agriculture is something some of us agriculturalists get very worried about, that it's mining nutrients or using fossil fuels. Does anybody else want to come in or, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to sort of be a bit provocative here to open up the discussion. Um, can I can I add some 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 recent experience uh, in sure. Mozambique? Right. You might you might be aware of the Climate Launchpad Initiative. Are you? I don't know. I am not. Okay. But let's okay. Tell so that's 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 a, a kind of a competition, a worldwide competition, which was only brought to to Africa last year with Irish aid funding. Uh, but it is an EU kind of an, an initiative. I think it has been running for um, four or six years. I can't recall exactly how much. But basically, uh, it it motivates um, um, young people to apply with to compete with ideas uh, addressing uh, ideas which which uh, would contribute to a greener economy. Okay. So uh, and and the majority of those applying on um, that competition have actually been the young generation, not not really uh, the older the older one. So what we are seeing here is that uh, because of the the more consciousness that that the young generation is in relation to the climate change um, uh, challenges that that the world is facing, they see themselves in the front line to come up with solutions, but that will really bring them some additional uh, income and to start the the adult life. So they have been looking at the environment, they have been proposing uh, lots of ideas that during that competition, they, they, they go through a series of boot camps to try and develop their business uh, uh, plan. Uh, to compete, but the the ultimate result is actually the exposure that they get and the, the 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 solidarity among themselves that they build because the young generation is actually working around those networking kind of approaches. So it has been amazing to see uh, if if they are uh, if they have entry points with ideas to bring out solutions to concrete problems um, uh, that they are addressing in their own areas of living or um, or intervention uh, they can quite easily build um, um, have a sort of a catalytic role in terms of bringing them together a series of other elements for a more complete chain uh, in the business so i just wanted to share this because um, i see the young generation really want, willing to engage on climate change adaptation and mitigation more through an enterprise kind of approach but addressing the the the, the greener economy elements yeah what I really like about what you've said is it's uh, open to innovation and uh, being pr um, propositional by young people. So if young people have an idea, they can put it forward and get funding for it. I suppose the challenge is getting the criteria right. You know, the green, the well, climate resilience in the criteria so that these businesses are green businesses or resilient businesses. Sounds great. Uh, and does anybody else want to contribute on that? We've had about 10 minutes. We could move on from enterprises to young gender and getting young women involved because I, I think this is a very serious challenge. We all recognize the importance. We all talk about it. We put it in our proposals. 
We put it even in the monitoring and these sorts of like methodology sometimes, but is it happening in practice, really? Um, love to hear what you think. Shahil. Hi, um, I'd like to echo mostly what uh, Mahmoud Amiti talked about, how um, women are in the forefront of you know, bat, you know, tackling adaptation in terms of climate change, because it's usually when it comes to home in our, our country's rural areas, when it comes to home um, vegetation growing and cultivation, it's usually the women who do it right beside the house, like a small of a pet project from where they can take a bit of crop or like produce for their daily domestic usage. And from there, it usually booms a bit. Um, suppose one person thinks, oh, I can like get, say, I can get let's say five um, X vegetable from here. What if I increase it by a bit, a bit more how much would I get? The extra I can sell off. That's one of the aspects. And something that I'd want to flag as well. Um, last year, when we were doing our Gobeshner conference, we had this um, organization, CCDB, Christian, uh, Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh. They had this interesting ad adaptation technology. It's not mostly on the climate change aspect, but rather in the public health aspect. It's basically for women who are pregnant. And people who lack the knowledge can basically get, let's say, a, a wristband that gives them weekly or monthly update as to whether or not they should go check a doctor or get a, whether or not they should go get a, go for a checkup. And it doesn't run on internet, it doesn't run on anything, it just runs on solar and basically radio waves and has a timer in it with a set information for, for that and it's very cheap. So I thought that it's a very interesting way of getting women into their, um, being more aware of, about their health and as well as how it works. So very good. Um information and communication tool so we can definitely use digital innovations and technologies for that um what about um making you know business or delivering um enterprises do you think there's any opportunity there using technology kisulu can we bring you into the conversation have you got any reflections I'm not sure if they're there. I've got a, a general point about um, the Sikhan gender experience, if, if we can't reach Kisilu. Yeah, we, I don't think we can. We're not having any luck with Kisilu. I just thought I'd yeah, try. Yeah, shame, shame. Not sure what's happened there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with our partners, we're working in rural Nepal on climate smart agriculture. And it turns out that most of the active farmers are women in a lot of the villages because of the prevalence of male out-migration, you know, um, the conditions have become a real struggle in the villages economically and even before COVID hit, you know, many of the, the men had migrated to the urban areas or even overseas for work. And so um, it's uh, Lee Bird is the name of the NGO that we've been uh, working with and, and probably practical actionism as well actually um, but they were uh, th there's this climate resilient village program uh, throughout Nepal and um, initially some of the agricultural technologies being promoted the climate smart agricultural technologies being promoted were a bit sort of male biased in terms of um, just like um, the physiology of the person who uh, was envisioned to be using these different tools and implements. And then I think after a bit of road testing, <laughs> they realized that you, you kind of like change the, the shape and size of, you know, like the threshers and the planters um, to be more appropriate for, for women's hands, uh, you know, to, to operate. And uh, that's kind of taken off now. We, we've just published a case study, this, a short case study this week about it. So that's, that's good. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, no, no, sorry. The next one's a COVID point. I'll save that, <laughs> carry on. Okay, all right. <laughs> Katie, do you want to come in? Yes, maybe um, maybe just share something that it has always been important to uh, not lose sight when we are working with rural women as well, is uh, the type of activities or technologies that are being introduced do not remove the social element of women socializing with each other, uh, because that's that's 
extremely important, at least here in this part of Africa, it is extremely important that activities and technologies do not put women on a more isolated kind of. So it's the support network that, that, that women have. So one, technologies that uh, on one side really do not add on to the time burn that women already have uh, because they, they are addressing so many activities, etc. But secondly, that it still keeps some time together for the social networking supporting systems. Once again, the communication technology, the ICT technology may be able to give them time. Is that your point? Sorry, I didn't get it. That um, technologies, especially digital and ICT technologies, can enable women to participate without um, impacting on their, the multiple burdens they have, multiple, you know, the, the time. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. I was not really focusing on the ICTs. I was really okay. um, uh, focusing more on the more hard kind of technologies on the ground to help them address the essential services that they have to deliver or to assist with livelihoods and all that. So it's not really accessing information and, and, and that, but it's, it's, it's just making sure that the climate change adaptation technologies that are being brought to those communities are not isolating like a single household de delivering on everything because the social network that they need to do within the community is extremely important uh, yes. for many other social reasons. A really good point, yes. Uh, just on the drudgery, I couldn't agree more. What a good point. Um, so that's one reason why uh, they were dubbed um, women friendly agricultural tools, the ones that the climate smart tools that were um, being widely adopted in Nepal because the women said it reduces our drudgery. So yes, <laughs> I can echo that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, I think maybe we should, um, if we had Let's bear in mind when we move to COVID that they, some of these um, subjects uh, cross over actually. So, but let's consider this now and then think about what would it be the main messages we'd want to take back to plenary regarding how technologies can enable young people to thrive. So on the COVID uh, lens, clearly the current situation has changed. Uh, Nepal, definitely. So, I mean, the dynamics have changed, but I wonder whether it's now causing uh, an issue that these are young men mainly who are coming back. Is it young men mainly who are coming back from overseas and now back in rural areas for the time being? Uh, or people who have returned to rural areas because the jobs in the towns aren't there or the business isn't there. So they're dependent on rural areas now for their, well, their livelihood or probably asking themselves, what are they going to do? Have you experienced this? Is it um, a reality in Bangladesh or Nepal or Mozambique? Yeah, that's, um, I, I believe so, but I actually don't have a detailed readout from the, the partners on the ground about that. I have more like information from the Voices from the Frontline project about how um, young people are using ICTs um, and actually this experience was more from India to set up online marketing of uh, grocery provision. I think, uh, I think also there may have been a Bangladesh example of that, like using, because the thing is there's lockdown. So um, there hasn't been, you know, some fresh dissemination smart agricultural tools or something is not possible. This is more like um, expanding the use of ICT of smartphones and, you know, internet connected devices that people already had before the lockdown and how they are bending it to new uses. So yeah, the Voices from the Frontline was documenting um, youth led initiatives on online marketing and then delivery of groceries to um, different households and also um, particularly in the Nepal case uh, mounting campaigns against misinformation so like we've had so many anecdotes from communities all over the place from uh, CSOs about misinformation with respect to like where COVID has come from, <laughs> what it's associated with, what behaviors and so forth. And of 
who are then, you know, coalescing and organizing campaigns to um, put out robust information. Um, I'd like to drop in on that as well a bit. Um, on the words of um, ICT, basically, um, in our country, we specifically did not have a good trust towards online marketing, or online um, websites for marketplaces. But in the recent times, due to COVID, um, people have stopped going to like physical shops and whatnot, and the online area has boomed a bit. This is usually where um, the youth who, ha who do a bit of handicraft or basically, let's say, who do a bit of work with something of their own have used Facebook or social media as like a marketing place sort of, and they preach that I have this product. If you want, I can send it to you. You don't have to come to me. And that's something that's interesting. And the other one that I want to talk to you about is basically <laughs> Voices from the Front Lines is basically it's a story from Africa. It's The story has not been published yet. It's it's, it's trailer, sneak peek, sort of. Um, it's basically for the reclaimers from Africa and how their um, government did not give enough information regarding COVID. And they took up the opportunity to find uh, basically a place of collaboration where they collaborated with medical staff and people who are who do social work to spread the knowledge and as well spread the medical awareness between the people. And that's some sort of an opportunity that's not really always present for the youth as youth don't get the voice um, rights as let's say someone older. And that allowed the youth to basically speak up and tell, guys, look, this is how you should protect yourself to, uh, against COVID, or this is a, what the social measures, measures, you should, measure, measures you should be taking. So yeah, sorry, a bit of a tongue twister. So yeah, that, I think a few opportunities here and there have been created. Maybe um, an innovative one, or maybe something that has already existed, but just got extrapolated. That's great. Um... I can imagine, I mean, we, we've had quite, probably one of these sort of places with the strongest messaging from our country offices of the changing demographic uh, has been Nepal. I think because Nepal had so many overseas workers um, and that sort of changed the economy, changed the, the um, occupation of a lot of people. But I would imagine the people who have come back actually are quite initially, quite resource, well, they'll be well educated, they'll understand technology well, they'll have the tools required to engage with these digital uh, innovations, you know, the smartphones and, 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 and expect uh, to be able to still use them. So maybe that is part of the dynamic. What about the tensions it might cause though, where you've got now suddenly could there be a conflict over resources? Could there be a conflict over power? I'm not sure. Is it a time to uh, think of a new normal in some of these physical locations where you've got people now residing for longer? I'd like to weigh in on the initial bit of your statement. Um, there was a session uh, two days ago uh, on, I believe, uh, overcoming barriers to youth inclusion. And one of the partners spoke about how uh, we should come overcome the idea of mass individualism, but and consider everyone as a global community. So that, like, let's say, if one person has more power or access or skills than the other, it will lead to a, a how do I put this? Um, a disturbance in the balance. But if we consider everyone as like basically a piece of the puzzle and supporting one another, it shouldn't lead to that situation, and but rather lead to a full streamlined area yeah and that's what I thought was very interesting and could be plotted here as well so great point can we capture that in the notes there uh, when we're mindful of time we've got five minutes left but I see Kisulu's picture which is great uh, can you you can hear us you're smiling so maybe just introduce yourself and there's only five minutes left I want to give you some time to comment on either of these questions it could be the enterprise technologies that work for young women or COVID. Um, would you like to share? You're on mute at the moment, Kisulu. Kis Kisilu. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kisilu Bosia. I'm a climate activist. Uh, my experience through farming is I've come to realize that 
young farmers or young generations are not that much willing to join in farming. So because uh, they think farming is under the job. Now, what I can uh, put uh, as a practice as from today onwards is to standardize the farming so that it can be attractive to the youth uh, by involving the younger generation in farming discoveries. That is, uh, uh, conduct some researches with them so that when they discover anything in farming, they take it as their inventor. Uh, they take it as their, you know, solution to the farming. That also we can come down to them and listen to them, uh, to their perspective, what they are thinking about farming, so that we can strengthen their understanding, standardize it, and support them coming to understand what farming means. Because without farmers or without farming, we won't feed the global community. You see, Lewis, okay. Last thing, last thing, uh, talking about gender. You know, with some customs, they have different jobs done by different sex, either boys or girls. But this time, we have to understand that if a lady or a boy shows to do something which is da not done by boy or sounds like a really good point was coming. Uh, 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 it looks like your connection is getting worse. Do you want to we have to accept. Okay, so look, can you switch off your picture and make that gender point for us, please? So that we you have good signal. Try switching off your video. I don't know if we can disconnect your video so we can hear your voice. Yeah. Right, Kisulu, try again. Uh, you were making a point about gender. You were just to make a really, about to make a really exciting point. Yeah, you know, I noticed that ladies are very much ignored in, in some communities, but I've come to realize they are talented in one way or another, and mostly in farming. So, because they are the majority who are remaining at, the, at some community, in, in some communities, they have to be allowed to carry on our practice, whatever they feel like doing regardless of whether custom accepted or not. Yeah, in, our, in our area, farming is mostly supported by ladies and they are feeding our community and they're doing well in, in researches, like what we can plant, how we can plant, and how we can sustain the farming. Thank you. Thank you, Kisuru. So we have got one minute left. I'm thinking about the points that we'll take back to plenary. Shahail, are you going to take back to plenary, or shall I, or do we have, um, doesn't no. it have to be? I'm not engaging you. Uh, I was asking Shahail if he was going, as rapporteur, having taken notes, he wants to come back to plenary for us, or do you want me to do it? Um, anyone is fine, whichever is convenient by you. I took all the notes that's necessary for this so that I can get the debrief later on. Okay. Well, I mean, the key points that I see that we have um, are we do need to talk about enterprises um, and um, the fact that uh, there are green uh, enterprises that young people can engage. This, the idea of uh, getting people to innovate and, and supporting those green ideas is one way to um, unlock, I think, that opportunity. We've talked a lot about digital and, um, and communication, saying how, how important that can be, especially with the issue, access to women and improving, empowering them. Uh, we're talking about uh, voices from the front line. I think really important that we, we get this information out. Um, and lastly, I think discoveries, one of the key things I noted there. Um, 
young people be able to sort of be discover and empower and i think uh the last point that um was being made was that people need to be supported to research and innovate um because they use local knowledge to do that those were the three i've captured right um also i'd like to include the last point that was made is uh, women are denied in areas where they should not be and since they provide majority of the farming and as well as the um, cultivation of crops they should be allowed to do so if they're good because they're good at it and it allows for equality even yes. if the community does not allow allow to do so yes uh, welcome back everybody from the breakout session oh that was a that was a that was not so nice for us we're waiting for others to join us josh Yes. Yeah, I was saying I was saying that was not so nice for us because we're in the middle of really something uh, interesting, and then we just came back. <laughs> we just came back here. Um, but anyways, I hope that everyone had a very uh, um, engaging conversation. Certainly, for our group, we had uh, very difficult questions to think about. Uh, the questions that do not have straight answers. So everyone had to like scratch their head a little bit and see what they could produce. Um, so that was great. At this point, um, I'm going to open up for uh, folks to sort of give a, a quick uh, a feedback from the uh, from their breakout rooms. Um, so what I'm going to do is to sort of call the the facilitators of the groups, and then you can choose to do that, or you can as well uh, give the floor to uh, members of the group to give a summary. So I'm going to start with Christine. Uh, uh, and Shandla, you were in one group, um, please, you can either do it yourself or you can allow someone in the group to do that. And you have two minutes to just give really, uh, um, yeah. So please go ahead, yeah. Yes, uh, Christine, would you like me to still? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Chandler. Um, so, we picked out some of our main points uh, for question one was uh, looking at the chicken and manure management systems that Naman's talked about and how we can how we can enable youth um, through bringing online marketing tools um, and and physical marketing tools to them and we thought um, ways in which that that can be achieved is through uh, mobile technology through having access to laptops and tablets that we can, um, that, that, that can enable them to, for instance, forecast weather, um, they can monitor their agricultural systems, their crops, um, they can create analytical systems, that way they can, uh, they can use that to, to bring to market systems. Um, and that's, that's kind of the main technology that we thought would in, engage the, the youth. Um, moving on to question two, uh, we highlighted some of the systems that are in place already, but like water collection storage systems um, uh, and, and, and really focusing on handing empowerment to women to take on the leadership roles of these types of systems um, to become community leaders uh, through um, creating their own small scale businesses um, uh, through uh, adaptation technologies. Um, and so we highlight a couple of the different types of technologies that are already in place. Um, and, and Anna had a good point of, uh, for instance, handing over a, the, the responsibilities for the indigenous seed banks and being the, really the community leader to, um, to provide the, 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 the management of that. Um, and we also talked about um, savings schemes, savings and credit schemes, and how that needs to be handled where um, men and women can create a dialogue to have an understanding that women will take on this role uh, of this financial role, um, more so than in the it typically is, is done. Um, and moving on quickly to the last uh, question, uh, we didn't really have much time on that one, unfortunately, but we were thinking that uh, during COVID, we, we've really seen an uptick in, um, in, in technologies, of course, and we think that we need to basically provide more access to the technology that youth can get online and start 
using um, using these online means to in, to engage them, to empower them, and to uh, help propel that propel them forward. So, great. Um, would you would you want to give like a takeaway action? Uh, um, sort of one one thing that people from this meeting can do um, from the from your breakout room. Um, well, I think our biggest takeaway action would would be. In, in devising a, a, a means to, to really bring the, the technology to the people. I think, that's, I think that's one of the biggest things is that the youth, um, they don't have the access to, and kind of hard ringing in on my last point there. Um, I think that if we can provide, if we can try and come up with, a, with, with uh, plans to provide this means of, ac this ac means of access to technology, that would be, I think, the biggest key. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very useful. Does anyone in the group want to add anything, or this is uh, you are all satisfied with this? <laughs> all right. I don't see uh, any reaction. So Chandler, that was awesome. Uh, thank you. Get your new job at BBC to to give uh, <laughs> <laughs> some risk to difficult conversations. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, quickly, um, I'll move on to my group where I was there with Sake Finn. Uh, and Caesar, uh, and we managed to do a very do justice to some of the questions. Um, who would want to give the 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 summary of that? Um, Finn, do you want to? Sakib? If not, I'm also happy to do it. Just let me know. Great. If you'd like to start, then maybe we can pitch in if we think there was any other key points to cover. Perfect, that's okay with me. So yeah, we, we had the chance to first look at question one, uh, which was around um, enabling uh, technologies for young people, uh, looking at the enterprise side. And that quickly moved us to how to access resources to access the technology. First of all, we believe that most of the technologies are in the processing side, not at the food production side itself, but if you don't produce food, you can process it. You can render the services that are around the agricultural services, but you need a food first, the, the, the agricultural process itself first. So there's a need to sort of shift the technological narrative of providing all these tech platforms to deliver food, to create online market for food, all these are great, but if there is no agricultural products, these services will not function. Hence, there is a need to put a lot of effort into increasing technologies for the, the, the production phase itself. And there we talked about how difficult it is to access land, how difficult it is to access loans, how difficult is it for, for young uh, uh, farmers or young agricultural practitioners to access markets. And uh, the challenges uh, are very sort of uh, culturally uh, blended in a way that is not easy to solve. Hence, uh, one of the solutions that came up, of course, very well known is uh, establishing cooperatives, which is great. But the issue with cooperatives is also that when you have a cooperative, it takes a long time for them to sort of become independent. Hence, there is a need for external uh, funds and external resources to come in uh, to support in building uh, the, the cooperatives up that they are able to access market. Uh, here, there are a few solutions that we came up with. One, uh, I think really uh, emphasize on the need for young people at the community level in the agricultural sector, in rural areas to identify key actors, where key actors could be uh, identifying an upcoming policy, a policy maker, someone within the community who have access to government interventions because there's a lot of money locally, but you need to align your work, you need to align your solutions, your projects, the activities you do towards these policies. Uh, so aligning that towards those policies allow you to access funding and access the resources that are available locally. Now we moved on to sort of uh, critical barriers, particularly money, assessing credit, and how young people can get credibility. Here we moved on a bit to the second question around young women, where uh, in general in communities, women themselves, uh, some cases don't even have access to their own money. They don't manage their own funds. This is managed by the husband or by someone else. Uh, and in most cases as well in rural areas, you don't have banks so close to you that you can save in a bank and st stock up uh, money to, to be 
eligible to us as a sort of credit and loans. Uh, and here uh, we were just getting into that when our call, uh, our breakout room was ended. Uh, but the general understanding was to come up with a mechanism that brought credibility for young people, for young women in the rural context, that they will be able to access credit facilities beyond the obvious challenges they face, such as not able to have a bank account, not being able to stock up money uh, at the bank to show that this is how much money I've managed or saved in the past year, so I'm, I'm accessible or I should be eligible for this loan. Um, then I think the last point uh, which I will want to raise is um, the need for capacity building uh, to sort of train people or train young people uh, on very my minor things which doesn't require so much money to train, such as saving their data in a cloud system, getting training on uh, how to computerize their records, uh, as well as different management services which they can easily apply uh, and work with which then sort of link back to what we discussed, talked about earlier, increasing their credibility that they're able to show that this is our records for the past five years working in this farm. Um, and this also sort of boosts the, the chances of them being able to access uh, uh, resources to advance technology. And this really links to the third question where we're looking at COVID. And most of the COVID technologies that have come up have mainly been on cloud-based uh, cloud-based and digitalizing uh, things that you would otherwise do manually. So external input or external support funds uh, resources are needed to build capacity of young people on these basic uh, technology uses and digital uh, processes that they are able to uh, advance when it comes to technology in rural areas. This is it. Um, Sake, Caesar, Finn, please throw in if I forgot anything. No, I, th I think that covers pretty much everything. I, I, just to reiterate, I think one of the key ones that we were sort of circling around is, again, going from the problem side, how to move it to the solutions is identifying the partnerships. A lot, a lot of the times that's really the crucial bit that a lot of young people are sort of lacking, whether it's for identifying uh, people that can fill in knowledge gaps and capacity building or that can assist them in sort of entrepreneurial uh, interests, et cetera. So I think maybe using some of the key takeaways from our group talk would be to sort of uh, hone in on identifying the partnerships that the young people should focus on. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, then I will move on and take um, Chris. Um, are you here with us? Hi, Shahail is going to do it on for our group. Uh, he's really great. So Shahail, please, uh, the floor is yours, yeah. Hello, hi. Um, so we talked about a lot of things in our in our group, but the majority thing that came up was basically on inclusion for youth and as well as women. We found out that um, the agriculture aspect for um, understanding whether or not this is more of a financial aspect rather than an agricultural aspect was more, pro when we discussed about it, it came up in our country that is in Bangladesh that youth and let's say the people who are finishing the undergrads are people who are very interested in towards making a very small quick buck through like, let's say, um, at a, um, agricultural processes such as bioflocking, that's basically in how indoors fish farming or chicken farming indoors. That way, it basically allows or propagates the, the youth to get in, interested or involved towards agriculture. And the other topic, the, the point that came up was basically to approach it towards it as a greener business rather than agriculture itself, and allow the youth to go through research and as well as for um, go through a sort of a, like a farm discovery, so that. Once you find something that's innovative towards farming, that's yours, you can go on and make a business out of it. And we need to allow them to connect to one another and lead. And through awareness, we can allow youth to basically catapult into agricultural development through the idea of business and how it can allow them to have a bit of um, earning on the side other than academics. The other thing that we talked about when we came to women is basically how women are usually marginalized when, during these situations, because as you mentioned that it's usually the men who basically bring in the money and I believe one of the topics that came up is in Nepal, um, the males uh, migrated right before the COVID situation and couldn't come back. And it was women who had to go through farming or cultivation. And it was found out that the, tech, the tech technology that they had was not equipped for women. And therefore they had to basically adjust the size or adjust the weight or basically allow for um, the uh, technology to mold towards a more inclusive manner to allow both the uh, genders to utilize it 
and we found out that was very interesting as well. And one of the other topics that came up was that there is a there are events called Climate Launchpad where you're allowed to come up with green ideas and pitch them to a, to an organization and your idea will be if it's selected it will be used for basically incubation purposes and later then can be scaled up into a business a business centric manner which can also include agriculture practices and whatnot so the idea on youth as a covid in creating new technologies what we talked about is rather than looking at a technological aspect we could look at it as a opportunity aspect like let's say in our country or in a third world country like india as well uh, we rely heavily on e-commerce now, granted the fact that COVID did not allow people to go out to physical shops and basically buy their requirements, the idea of like selling stuff online through like, let's say Facebook or other social media has boomed. Let's say a youth decides or um, someone else decides that I can make something like, let's say handicraft and I want to sell it online. That's possible now because there's a larger market base for it. Um, that leads to youth inclusion as well as women inclusion. The other idea is that through opportunities, um, the, I, uh, the story came up from Africa is um, the organizations, re reclaimers of Africa, um, decided that the information on COVID was not really comprehensive through the government and that they had to step up and basically um, connected with other organ uh, organizations and committees and form the actual um, information for how you can protect yourself against COVID, dispel, uh, dispel um, sorry, basically use dispenser, um, sanitizers and whatnot. And these are ideas and opportunities that has sprung up due to the fact that COVID has come around and new technologies were basically thrust upon. Now, the other idea is that the women are denied in areas where they should not be denied at. Basically, let's say in Bangladesh, women um, idea of cultivating the vegetable on the side is like a pet project that they start with. And then they realize, wait, this pro provides for my family as well as if I scale it up a bit, I can provide for my family through monetary as well, or save up the money for myself. Now, the idea is that the community does not look at it in a good eye. Now, the interesting topic, word that came up was, whether or not it is accepted by the community should not matter. As long as it's bringing in inclusivity and as long as it's bringing in, allow the, allowing them to have a business-centric idea, it should be allowed nonetheless. The other idea that came up was mass individualism should be foregone. Let's say if someone is good at something or has a good skill or is, a bit more adept than others, that will cause disparity if that person thinks of himself or herself as that person is better than the others. If they all think of the, each other as a global community, it allows for everyone to be in a streamlined manner. So I think that's a lot of information that hits you, but yeah, that's a roundabout idea of what we talked about. Um, Chris, if you wanna add something to that, or if I miss something. That's very good. I like the phrase, uh, encourage young people to make farming discoveries so they own it. Mm -hmm. That was the phrase used by one of our participants, really grabbed me. <laughs> Great. That should certainly be one of the key outcomes of today's session. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. So that was really uh, impressive. Quite a lot of different things um, to, to look at. Um, Jennifer and Mamuda, please um, go ahead. Okay. Now uh, it's nice to see some of the points that we discussed are also, you know, discussed in other groups. So I'm getting that uh, we are just one big global family that facing the same challenges and maybe looking for solutions that might work. So uh, in our group, um, with the first question, how can adaptation technology enable young people to engage in rural agriculture and enterprise? So what we found out um, that there aren't enough opportunity for young people uh, in the, you know, ICT and technical uh, technology uh, sector. For example, that uh, in the rural areas, especially in the least developed countries, there aren't enough uh, technical devices available. And even so, the, even they have technical devices, there aren't enough internet connection. So that also uh, hampers if somebody wants to get access to any information on uh, rural agriculture or climate change adaptation. So that is one point. And also one of the uh, points that came out under this question is that just like I think in the second group, they talked about identifying key actors. So um, identifying key actors and bringing them all together to discuss what opportunities are already available. Maybe there, uh, because we know that people have 
amazing ideas about climate change adaptation in, you know, in the rural areas or in the urban areas. But when we come together and discuss, uh, have more information that might enable young people to look for solutions because there might be local solutions already available, but we don't know about it. And using ICT and online forums to have that discussion can really help in the food production, supply chain, and market value at the same time. So when we discussed about how can adaptation technology work for young women or looking at the gender lens, um, a few points that came out, uh, we had a good discussion on, you know, a, a bit of comparative discussion between Bangladesh and Kenya. So that was really interesting. Um, but I think it's the same um, even in Bangladesh and in uh, Kenya that women are encouraged to have, uh, you know, household uh, income um, schemes. For example, if they have, a if they can start a poultry farming, and they can also use that uh, waste of um, poultry and livestock and use that to compost in a vegetable gardening at the back of the houses. And it can also be, uh, it can also start at a low cost and at the same time, it can generate some income from women. Um, because we are still struggling to involve women in the agricultural sector um, in the LDCs. So this might be a beginning and maybe we should uh, think about more to explore more opportunities for young women to get involved in the ag agricultural sector. One of the key highlights that we uh, found or talked about is that maybe women are more eager to get involved with the solution, trying to find solution, which we also find in Bangladesh in the rural areas. But there's a social stigma that hampers their active participation in the adaptation technology or agricultural sector that they are discouraged to go out or they're discouraged to maybe uh, take part in the discussions that involves only men. So if we can overcome that, maybe we can have more, uh, we can create more opportunity to uh, get a women involved, especially the young women. And maybe we also need to uh, change our outlook at how we look at women getting involved in the farming. So the third question was, how has COVID created new technologies related opportunities for young people to engage in adaptation? So um, a few information that we have is that um, just like anybody else in the rural areas, women are also seeking more technical, technological devices, especially the poor and disadvantaged community who do not have access to money or if women, we know that women have a tendency to spend more money for the family's need and not enough for themselves. So how can we create that financial opportunity so they can actively uh, you know, access information and technical devices to keep uh, their work going and to initiate new green projects. Um, at the same time, what we found out that shrimp and crab farming in Bangladesh has been suffering a lot, especially uh, where women are involved in the coastal regions. So they faced a, a big loss in the crab market because export has stopped for now. So this is one part that where te te adaptation technology can help out uh, the women uh, farmers. And at the same time, one of the examples from Kenya was that enterprises are um, more customer focused now. So they're more to the neighbors, to the community people, instead of going big in the export uh, one or export a business. So small farmers are unable to access market. So if we think about any uh, solution to bring them all together, maybe uh, they won't lose their business and they will be more adapt, uh, they will be able to more adapt to the changes due to the COVID crisis. So the, well, we have three takeaway or action points. Um, one is we need to enhance the opportunity and access to ICT and communication technology for young people. I think every group has that point. And at the same time, we need to, uh, number two, we need to reduce cost that, uh, to begin a green business on, or agricultural business for young people. Or maybe we need to have a different uh, financial scheme. We know that we had a session on innovative financing. Maybe we can, uh, you know, really can find some solution if we merge those findings together. 
And lastly, we need to change our mindset on how we look at women who want to work and support in the agricultural sector. So yeah, that's the full report from group four. If I missed anything, I would request anyone from our group to just add new points. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. That was a very detailed one. Uh, thanks for that. Thank um, you. If anyone wants to add, I see claps all over the screen, so that is fine. I guess um, we are good. Great, so um, I'm gonna take the next, uh, the next group. Um, and here I'm looking at Naman uh, and Robert. Um, so whoever wants to, to speak on that, please uh, unmute and go ahead. No man will, Robert will present our... our uh, yes, thanks, thanks, thanks Naman. Uh, please do jump in and uh, it's very difficult to go after a very, very elaborate, uh, elaborate uh, <laughs> report. So we're gonna be much shorter. So for the first question on how can adaptation technology enable young people to engage in rural agriculture, uh, we thought that the main thing is that the adaptation technology allows a young person to have a li good living so that it opens up this opportunity. So it needs to be income generating and it needs to have potential to be income generating. Moreover, it should be innovative because young people like innovative things. So it, make, it will make their involvement easier. Technologies also need to be understandable to the youth. Uh, they should not be complicated and they should be benefiting the youth. Uh, very important, it should allow the youth to connect with markets. Um, it, these technologies should be also replicable. They should make the work in agriculture more simpler. Um, also very important uh, point that we discussed is that, that technology should be easily communicated and synchronized with the local knowledge available because that will then increase the adoption, but also it will uh, help in, um, in uh, closing the intergenerational gap in the use of local knowledge. Uh, in terms of the second question of how can adaptation technologies work for young women, um, well, one of, one of the aspects that, uh, that was discussed that really came out strongly is that um, adaptation technologies uh, need to, uh, like, we, uh, the, the role of women in many societies, uh, you know, are related, uh, in rural areas are related to the household chores. So adaptation technology needs to give them time to participate in income generating activities while also participating in in these households. Very important is that uh, these technologies are locally available as well. And then one point that we discussed as well was that uh, the question of access to technology and uh, access of women to technology, it's important uh, that these adaptation technologies sometimes challenge cultural norms. So we mentioned of examples, for, in, for instance, where uh, women uh, due to their cultural uh, expectations were not, uh, although they would be getting uh, uh, a flood early warning system information, they would not be able to act on it. Uh, in terms of the third question, well, our discussion was uh, much more about, um, was much more about general about COVID and the, the, the role of technology in COVID. Uh, so there were some interesting examples from Kenya where the families would come with, uh, you know, given the rules for social distancing, washing hands, and the, there was a lot of water consumption at household level. There were interesting examples of how people came up with these uh, innovative, uh, like they were innovating at household level, then they would be reusing the, reusing the um, uh, water from washing the hands to, um, to water the vegetables in the gardens. Um, there were also other example, uh, example uh, given for instance, the youth in Tanzania, uh, because the youth is technology sassy, and then they would be, you know, they've seen that since sometimes COVID was an income generating opportunity for them because what they would be doing is they would be helping in the, in the neighborhood by going to the markets and bringing the stuff to the, you know, vulnerable, COVID vulnerable groups, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that was it in short. Thank you very much. Uh, that was, I really like um, the, the bit on synchronizing technology with local knowledge, really, really uh, important. Uh, so I'm happy to hear that. Um, I think we have one last uh, group to go and then we will um, bring everything uh, to one end. So we have Harrison uh, and Jim. Do we have Harrison and Jim? Did you have, um, do you know who's yeah. important? Great. <laughs> 
Yeah, Jim here for, for Harrison's group. Um, the problem with coming last is um, that most of the things have been said or what we'll be saying will just be repeating. So without repeating anything that has already been, been said, I'll be a, a bit brief. Uh, Harrison, if I miss anything, you can, you can add uh, later. So uh, under question one, we, we saw that, uh, that the youth are, the key, are, are very key partners in, in adaptive, uh, ad 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 adaptation technology. And uh, we say that uh, this, one, this is because they have the tools for negotiation. Uh, they are exposed to ICT, uh, they're exposed to internet. They know some of the most new uh, market approaches. So uh, for them to do well, well in this, then they had to be linked to uh, they had to be given a, a platform to exercise uh, leadership on the same, and this can be done by linking them to the older generation who uh, already have uh, the knowledge and uh, can transfer it to the, the young people. So um, uh, on, on the second one, um, we saw that uh, that women, uh, especially those ones in the in the, in the rural areas. Uh, are faced with a lot of barriers uh, to adapting technologies that require land, for, for example. And uh, with the introduction of, of, of this, then it makes it easier to understand, um, to identify and to understand some of the issues that they are, they are facing in adaptation technology. And um, if uh, some things were done, especially uh, education, then uh, it would be easier uh, for them to, to adapt some of this. So we got uh, an example from uh, from Bangladesh uh, where women were facing a lot of uh, issues with, with, with movement, access to law enforcement, and uh, access to ex exposure. And if uh, and if such were availed to them, then it would be easier for them to uh, adapt the technologies and even help them break out of the of the poverty cycles that they're usually in. And we found that we, women are most adaptive uh, in the society. And um, uh, with, with, with the with, with COVID, um, it made made them. I mean, it made it easy for them to have access to some of this because, as somebody has already mentioned, they are a, a big part in contributing to the family the family income. Um, uh, on, on the last question, um, uh, some of it have already been been said. Uh, but without repeating, uh, we said with the advent of COVID, there's a lot of reverse uh, cycles in terms of migration, uh, especially from the urban areas to the to the to the rural areas. And uh, with this, it enabled a lot of different uh, uh, adaptational technologies in terms of uh, in terms of ICT. And uh, since the youth are really attracted to digital digital technology. It has led to a lot of development uh, in, in technology like online marketing, development of small videos that can be sold or can be used um, in an, an enhancing technologies in the, in the rural areas. So there was also um, um, a case of youth uh, uh, taking up enterprises in the rural areas, in the areas of adaptive technology like, um, like, rearing, like rearing of uh, Italian redworms. Uh, that doesn't require a lot of doesn't require a, a lot of space or a, a, a lot of startup capital, and rearing the same and selling it to poultry farmers or the feed manufacturers or the feed blenders, and in, in that way they can have uh, almost a daily, I mean a weekly income. So uh, all the same, all the technology uh, we saw, like in Bangladesh, also how. Uh, young young men who are mostly uh, fishermen are now adapting technology uh, on marketing uh, uh, marketing their fish and uh, mainly been using uh, the, the, the Facebook um, the Facebook app. So um, uh, that's that's mainly it. Uh, great, uh, thank you very much. It. So Harrison, if there's anything you can you can add. No, nothing to add, Jim. Great. No, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I, I already get some cross-cutting themes, and I would like to get to that because um, we're running out of time. 
there is one more group left. <laughs> so that was not the last. Um, so I'm going to give the floor quickly to um, Jacob to, to report back from the seventh group. Um, and if there's anything that I've been said, you can skip that. If there's something else that we have to hear, please um, share with us. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll give uh, Maria this opportunity to uh, give the key summaries of our group. Welcome, Great. Maria. Maria, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, the report from Maria, your line is. Uh, thank you. Uh, from Group Seven, uh, we are echoing some of what has already been shared, so I won't take a lot of time. But on the innovative ideas under Group One, we had one a good example of aquaponics, uh, which. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please go ahead, yeah. Is it better mm -hmm. now? Yes, you can go ahead, yeah. Hello? Yes. Can you it hear me better. now, uh, Joshua? Okay. So under the innovative um, technologies, there's an example of aquaponics, which got the youth excited and the money through and then still under question one, uh, there was a strong uh, feeling. Okay, there was a strong feeling that, that there is need for us to. <laughs> it's better now. Okay, so there is a. I think it'd be better if Jacob reported back, Maria. You're dropping in and out too much. Jacob, do you mind uh, doing this quickly? Yes. Yeah. I'll drop a message to Maria. Yes, so, yeah. so, so uh, our key summaries on question one uh, was, uh, I know it is uh, already mentioned, is about, uh, we talked about uh, the online marketing platforms as one of the key, uh, one of the key technologies for young people to venture into uh, into agribusiness and enterprise. And so here we are looking at uh, young people coming together and, uh, and uh, putting all their, uh, all their enterprises uh, in, in a platform so that they are able to uh, make a gainful income from, uh, from different enterprises. So the, the second uh, technology we looked at uh, was about encouraging youth to venture into value addition. So uh, we gave an example of the horticulture industries. There are many opportunities for value addition and uh, youth uh, can be actively involved and uh, earn some gainful income once they're involved in value addition. So uh, I won't be going into the details of value addition, but we know there are different forms of value additions for every particular uh, maybe value chain. The other aspect to talk about, or, uh, we talked uh, about, was, uh, was about uh, uh, experience uh, uh, people in the enterprise uh, doing sort of mentorship to youth to be able to venture into agribusiness and enterprise. So here we are looking at people to support even the youth. So if maybe you are experienced in a particular enterprise, you're able to give advice or any if possible material support. So here we are looking at SMEs and we're looking at startups and maybe even SMEs can be able to mentor the startups to be able to come up to, uh, to some certain level. So we thought that that is also an, uh, uh, an important aspect of technology. So that is uh, in summary about uh, the first question. And so we moved to uh, question three about COVID. And so uh, about COVID, uh, we looked at uh, uh, we, we looked at how uh, COVID has 
uh, uh, has enabled the youth to adapt to the prevailing conditions in terms of uh, in terms of uh, creating income and uh, growth of the enterprise. And so here we related this to the issue of online uh, marketing platforms. So here they are able to uh, to 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 instead of doing the the manual uh, marketing they were doing before, they have ventured into um, into online marketing platforms and. Uh, from our discussions, we've seen that the online marketing, uh, marketing platforms are, are even cheaper. And uh, if the youth can be able to access them, and uh, one of the issues we discussed about youth in rural areas is about access to uh, to technology. How can the youth, uh, youth, uh, youth uh, sorry, access to these facilities that enable them uh, uh, get connected into these platforms? For example, access to smartphones, access to internet, how is this? So if youth have this, they should be able to venture actively into, into, uh, into online marketing platforms. Like we have seen some of them are doing as a result of uh, the challenges posed by COVID. So in summary, Joshua, uh, that is what we had for our group. Maybe right. Marie, do you have anything to add? I don't think, I don't think, um, I don't think she's here actually. I think her line dropped. Um, but yes, thank you uh, very much for the inputs. I'm very mindful of time and also mindful of um, people having to sort of step up to another me other meetings. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to sort of talk about cross-cutting elements of the different re report backs. Uh, so we see the centralizing uh, challenges and solutions uh, that we can think of when we leave this meeting. And I'll start on the gender topic because that was very principal to everything that each and every group reported back. And there are two elements I want to talk about. One is that in the context of adaptation and the need to drive adaptation solutions, um, we, we see that women are more keen to drive solutions. And I think this is very, very important to note in our key communication from this session, that women are key to drive solutions, but, and the, here the but is on different elements, but there's a social, uh, cultural barriers that limit their engagement. I think that is one, two, uh, ownership uh, and accessibility to enabling uh, tools that will enable them to drive these solutions even much further. And hence our work should look at providing so, uh, sort of uh, resources and key materials or projects that can help them to, first of all, overcome this cultural barrier, but also be able to access resources. Part of that is, uh, I think one of the groups reports on education and access to capacity building for women. And here we will know that uh, in rural context, the likelihood of getting a woman to show up in meetings, which are more generalized or training for farmers is very low because you have all the family heads, which are mostly men or all the landowners, which are mostly men showing up for such meetings. So very important when it comes to women that increase access to education, access to knowledge and capacity building, but also really we're putting much effort into a sort of structure that allow to overcome cultural uh, barriers that sort of um, uh, stigmatize the engagement of women in delivering solutions. Then secondly, I will talk about uh, what uh, some, uh, Chris, your group talked about uh, discovery. Uh, and I, I wrote down sort of a learning journey. And I think this is very important because jumping the gun to quickly develop solutions sometimes faces sort of either you're losing the money at some point because the solution doesn't fit uh, or you don't understand understand the sector so well that you end up uh, losing money and hence i really like the idea of combining research young people who are into research who are into the academia to go through a learning journey to discover uh, the, the real gaps within the sector sort of context specific uh, uh, gaps and be able to provide solutions to this through an enterprise approach. And then this also links back to what my group also talked about in terms of enterprise and sort of putting the economic returns to solutions that people are able to, young people are able to access sort of economic opportunities for delivering these solutions. Now, the third point I will talk about, which was also cross-cutting and very uh, key to mention is that, yes, the COVID situation now and the uptick of digitalizing uh, digitalized systems is opening up the markets beyond what 
rural youth would have access to. And this is an opportunity that we have to tap into. So for community-based uh, 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 young people working on, uh, uh, working, working in the agricultural sector, this is an opportunity if they have their skills match in place, if they have the capacity building, if they are trained on how to use digital systems, if they are trained on how to store their information in the cloud systems, this is an opportunity to really tap into. And I like the, the example given by Fisher, fishermen and women who sell fish, being able to post on Facebook to access a higher market than they would do given sort of 2019. So there's an opportunity for us to be able to increase uh, accessibility to market for uh, young people in the rural sector on agriculture. So that is the third. And then the last thing I'll mention also cross-cutting is how adaptation technologies could be localized to take advantage of local knowledge. Uh, and I think this is also very important that in our work, in our projects, in the way we, 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 we deliver uh, adaptation for communities and as actors on our own, we need to think around how, when we are bringing a technology on board, how that is localized or how that integrate with local uh, knowledge or how that is synchronized such that there's a higher uptake of such a technology and it doesn't face sort of uh, barriers locally because people do not understand the context or people does not see that as culturally correct or morally right, whatever that technology may be. So. These are cross garden things I want to talk about and highlight. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to allow um, Christine to sort of give final remarks, and we are out of here. Thank you very much for your patience with us on the time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Josh, for moderating the session, and thank you, everyone, for participating. You brought in critical issues and key messages that we shall be putting up to the CBA platform, and this will be disseminated widely. So just to thank you so much, I will not go back into the key messages because these have already been highlighted. So at this point, I guess we can close the meeting and wish you a good afternoon, a good evening, and a good morning to wherever you are. Thank you.